Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ave Maria Press Professional Development Webinar Series. In today's webinar, Deacon Harold Burke Sivers will discuss the role of the deacon in parish life. My name is Erin Pierce. I am the Parish and Curriculum Marketing Specialist at Ave Maria Press. Everyone in the audience is muted today, but you are able to ask questions. Questions may be sent to our presenter using the question box here on the GoToWebinar panel, and I'll read as many of those questions as possible at the end of the presentation today. This webinar is being recorded, and a link to the recording will be sent to you via email tomorrow. With that, I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter today. Deacon Harold is a Catholic author, international speaker, and deacon at Immaculate Heart Catholic Church in Portland, Oregon. Founder of dynamicdeacon.com, he also is the author or co-author of several books, including Behold the Man, Man, Father Augustus Tolton, and his new book, Our Life of Service. Deacon, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Honored to be here. Oh, we're, we're so pleased to have you. I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter. All right. Okay. Wonderful. I'll let you take it from here. All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's great to be with you, and I uh, want to wish you a, a very early Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, of course, enjoy the rest of Advent uh, as well. Um, again, I'm Deacon Harold Burke Sivers, and I'm uh, currently in uh, my uh, Portland, Oregon at home in my office. And uh, again, great to be with you here to share this important topic with you. So as you can see there, uh, this is a professional de development webinar series for today, and the uh, topic is going to be serving God's people together, the role of the deacons in parish life. Um, again, sharing some thoughts and reflections uh, on the diaconate and how uh, we can help serve better in parishes along with the priests and with catechists and, and lady and, and uh, religious educators and, and everyone. So, you know, could we work better, the more we can work better together, the more we can build up the body of Christ, especially now. You know, I've, I've uh, been on the road again. You know, I was home for over a year, um, not traveling or speaking because of COVID and uh, just started getting back on the road at the end of August. And a lot of parishes are still struggling to get people to come back to church post COVID. I guess people were used to watching mass in their slippers and pajamas. And, <laughs> and so there's all these initiatives that parishes are trying to do to get people uh, to come back. And so this, I think the time is ripe for parish staffs uh, to be working more closely together to really focus on, on building or rebuilding up the body of Christ once again. I want to specifically talk about how deacons uh, can assist in that role in a special way. So um, there's a, a document that came out called the Pastoral Conversation uh, of the parish community and the service of the evangelizing mission of the church. Um, this was a document that came out uh, not too long ago that talks about the challenges that parishes are facing uh, because of the uh, pandemic. Um, so here it talks about specifically uh, the diaconate role. It says that the deacon is a specific vocation, a family vocation that requires service. And why is that important? Because remember, um, the men that are ordained as deacons, they come, uh, most of them, for the, the vast majority, come from families. And so the, the church recognizes that these men are serving their families well, you know, the diaconia, you know, the servant of their families. And so they're recognizing those gifts. And um, the discernment process for the deacon is, is determining whether those gifts can be in service also to the church. Right, so so it's that's why I think Pope Francis here calls it a family vocation because it's a vocation that comes from serving well in the family and taking those gifts and using those gifts to serve well in the church. He said this word is the key to understanding your charism as deacons. Service 
as one of the characteristic gifts of the people of God, right? Um, because by our baptism, we receive the charisms of priest, prophet, and king. You know, everyone receives those gifts by baptism. So the priest is the one who offers sacrifice, right? And so we make a sacrifice of our lives to Christ and, and to the church, just like Christ broke himself open and poured himself out on the cross, you know, we break ourselves open and pour ourselves out in love uh, for our for our families, for the church and, and for the culture. Um, the prophet is the one who speaks the truth, you know, um, and, and the king is the one who serves. So that, that service um, charism comes from the fact of our, of our baptism, you know, uh, that we are this kingly role of service. St. Louis, for example, I think is a wonderful example, the great king of, uh, uh, of France, who uh, led his people by being the chief servant of his people. You know, um, he founded a number of homeless shelters and uh, hospitals, and he, in fact, he used to bring homeless people to his castle and serve them, you know, and then eat their leftovers. That was his main dinner, eating the leftovers from the homeless people he, that he had come and eat to eat at the king's table. You know, that that's the model of service um, that I think Pope Francis is talking about here. And so service is one of the characteristic gifts of the people of God. The deacon is, so to say, the custodian of service in the church, right? So in a special way, the deacon is called from, uh, by, by receiving this charism of service in uh, baptism and living out that service ministry in the family, the deacon then ass assists uh, the bishop with his ministry of service and evangelization, you know, because the, the 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 bishop can't do everything by himself. So he has priests to help him on his one hand, uh, and the priest's job is to predominantly facilitate communion, to bring people together around the body of Christ, particularly around the sacraments, most especially, of course, the sacrament of the Eucharist. And the deacon's job is to be a minister of evangelization. That's why even when the pope says mass, a deacon reads the gospel. Right, because he's the, the minister of evangelization of and it's not just good news, by the way. You know, um, the word evangelion in Greek or evangelium in Latin does mean good news. And uh, you know, especially as it was used in, in Greek, like in 300 years before Jesus in the in the time of Homer, it was used for soldiers returning from battle that were victorious. They would say, We have evangelion, we have good news, we won. It was also used the same way in the time of Christ, except when Caesar proclaimed news. Because when the king proclaimed news, Caesar, it just wasn't good news. It was life-changing news. Because news from the king could change your life. And so we serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so the encounter with the living God in the person of Jesus Christ is not just good news. It's life-changing news. Because news from the king. Jesus can change your life. And it's our job as deacons to be that public, uh, ordained, permanent, sacramental sign and witness of that service ministry to the world. So when we dismiss people, that's our job to help the bishop with that, with that task. And so when we dismiss people at mass, you know, ite missa s, go, she is sent, right? She is the church. Go and do what? To be Eucharist to the world, to bring that life-changing, message of Jesus Christ to everyone. And the deacon is one who does that in a very permanent, sacramentalized way. In fact, he's a sacramentalized sign of service to the church. And that's the way, primary way that we help uh, the bishop. And of course, one of the ways that we help with that evangel evangelization ministry is through service, not just service to the poor, right? Because we're not social workers, right? But, but also to the poor in spirit. Um, those who are broken, and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, those who need healing, you know, I think the deacon can help facilitate that in a very powerful way. Every word must be carefully measured, Pope Francis says. You are the guardians of service in the church, service to the word, to the altar, and to the poor, right? So, um, and that's typically how uh, the diaconates describe word, altar, and charity, but I like the, the Latin better, docendi, Santificandi regendi, teaching, sanctifying, and leading. Right? I think I think that's a more powerful description of actually what the what the deacon does in the life of the church. All right. So um, deacons are ordained 
this is from that that same uh, uh, same document. Deacons are ordained ministers incarnated in the diocese. They are collaborators with the bishop and the priest in a singular mission of evangelization with a specific task by virtue of the sacrament received to serve the people of God in a ministry of liturgy, word, and charity, all right? So again, um, I, I like the, the, again, the Latin is better, leading, uh, sanctifying, and, and uh, teaching, sanctifying, and leading. We must be careful not to see deacons as half priests, half laymen, right? Because, <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, there's this, um, Sometimes you hear people say, oh, you're a deacon. You're just like a priest, except you can't say mass and hear confessions, right? It's like, um, no, <laughs> we're not priests. We're not, you know, and the, the, the answer to the priest shortage is not more deacons. The answer to the priest shortage are more priests. I mean, we're, we're, we're not there to take the place of the priest. We're not half priests. We don't want to be priests. We're not like, oh, you can't, you know, you're, you're not celibate. So I guess you can't be a priest. I mean, that, it's none of that. It's none of that at all. Um, and, and I'm glad that um, that this document bears this out. We're not half priests or half laymen. Um, likewise, the image of deacon as a sort of intermediary between the faithful and the pastors is inappropriate. You know, so we're not just an intermediary. And, and I, I think the diaconate is still, in a, which is why I wrote this book, the diaconate in a lot of ways is, is uh, still in its infancy. You know, it's only been, what, 60 years, uh, almost 60 years after the council, of Vatican II, where the diaconate was restored as a permanent order. It never fell out of, uh, uh, of uh, service in the church. You know, it didn't not become an order, just transition from a permanent order to a transitional order in order to become a priest. And now we have both forms of the diaconate after Vatican II. Neither halfway between priests or lay people, nor halfway between pastors and the faithful. So Pope Francis speaks of ensuring that the deacon has his own identity uh, in relationship to both priests and laity, and that he is uh, serving the parish in a balanced manner with his proper charisms uh, that he received the ordination. You know, and I'll talk about that in a little bit because sometimes there could be some tensions that happen uh, in the parish over over all of this, over who gets to do what and, and whose roles and all that kind of stuff. Um, Deacons are ordained ministers. Oh, whoops, said that one already. I'm not used to using PowerPoint. If you ever see me speak, I just go out there and just let it rip. But <laughs> but uh, with PowerPoints here, you know, I'm just, uh, getting used to this a little bit. Um, okay, let's see here. All right. Uh, okay, good. All right. There are many ecclesial tasks that can be entrusted to the deacon, namely all those that do not involve the full care of souls, because obviously that's left up to the priest. The priests are the shepherds. And uh, I kind of see us deacons as, well, sheepdogs, you know? <laughs> and actually I wanted to include that in the book, but you know, I guess the editors didn't like that. They thought, oh, sheepdogs are offensive, but it's not really. I mean, imagine the shepherd trying to do his work without the sheepdog there, because the sheepdog, what does he do? He gathers, the people. So when we dismiss people out of mass, we're in the, as deacons, we're in the trenches with them as sacramentalized, permanent signs of witness of God's service ministry to the church. And so our job is to bring that message of the gospel, the, the, the life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ to the people. And so that um, uh, they, you know, when they hear that message they, and they want more, we gather them together and bring them to the service ministry of the priest back to the healing ministry of the sacraments back to the holy sacrifice of the mass and to 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 communion uh, with the body of Christ. A uh, very interesting thing here it, note, it notes from the code of canon law because canon law determines which offices are reserved for the priests and it has you know what priests do and what lay people can do but there's no <clears throat> indication of any particular office in which the deacon's ministry can find specific expression. That's interesting. Uh, I, I didn't really uh, realize that fully uh, until uh, researching this, um, that there's really, and I think this is part of the reason that there may be some tension in the parish between priests and deacons or lay people and deacons. Is, is he taking my job? I actually have a, a more advanced degree than the deacon. Why is he doing this kind of thing when I should be doing that, that kind of stuff? Because there's really no specific particular role that the deacon as listening canon law, I think that's 
uh, causes some of the tension. But at the same time, I think this provides an opportunity for parishes to be bold and creative in utilizing uh, deacons with the goal, again, of bringing souls to Christ by effectively witnessing uh, to the gospel. I think that's absolutely key. Um, given the congregation for the clergy's observations, as we just saw in the last uh, few slides there, there are two key areas of parish life where deacons, I think, can serve the church admir admirably. And that's what I wanna spend the rest of the presentation talking about, uh, two specific ways that we can do that and working together with uh, catechists and, and, and religious educators and others in the parish. And that's by bringing hope to those who are lost and serving as a bridge for racial reconciliation and healing, right? Which is a huge issue in, in our country and in our, in our world right now. So as ministers of evangelization, deacons can break open God's word of truth to bring light into the darkness. You know, remember Jesus says, um, don't keep your light under a bushel basket because no one can see it, right? And we, he says, we are the light of the world. And so, so often we're afraid. And when people say, why are you Catholic? We, we, we cringe and, you know, we, we don't want to speak out when they try to so-called redefine marriage and gender and all this stuff. We stay quiet. Oh, it doesn't, as long as it doesn't affect me. And we wonder why this culture runs roughshod over us. We wonder why 69% of Catholics don't believe Jesus is present in the Eucharist. We wonder why the median age for a, for a person to decide to make the intellectual decision that I am no longer Catholic is 13 years old. You know, we wonder why half of the people that join RCIA, join the Catholic Church through the RCIA process, leave after five years. You know, I mean, we, we have to do a much better job of witnessing to the power and the fullness of the truth and not be afraid, as Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, to speak the truth in love. And so that light cannot be kept in, in, in under a bushel basket where no one can see it. He says, put your light up on a hill so that when people see the good works that you do, they give glory to God, right? And that's what Psalm 115 says, right? Uh, 115 is one of the uh, Hallel Psalms, 113 to 118 and, and Psalm 135. Those are, are, are the praise Psalms, right? And Psalm 115 says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give the glory. So that by, by being the light of the world, we're actually allowing the light of Christ to shine through us, right? We're, we're, not, we're not the light, Christ is the light, but he uses us as his instruments, as his witnesses to the power of his love to the world. So we just, we cannot leave that light of truth, um, you know, undimmed. We have to make that light shine brightly. We can remind hurting parishioners that if we are to truly walk in the footsteps with Christ, then they must live their faith with complete trust in God. You know, um, uh, this this whole coronavirus thing, I think, has really shaken a lot. Of, these people that I've been talking to, traveling back on the road again, has shaken a lot of people's faith and has caused a lot of fear in people. You know, and and but I, I don't, now I, I understand that. But John says in his gospel, 1 John 4, in, in his epistle, in 1 John 4, 16, that perfect love casts out all fear. You know, God is love, and he who lives in love lives in God, and God lives in him. So the spirit of God that's in us is a, is a spirit, not of fear, right? Not of fear, uh, but of joy. You know, so we have, instead of focusing on so much of the news, that's why I don't watch the news or I'm not on social media very much anymore. I have someone that actually posts stuff for me on there um, because it's just so negative and so dark. A, a lot of that spirit, especially surrounding the coronavirus and all the conspiracy theories, I don't have time for that. You know, and we're, we're talking so much about these other worldly things that we're forgetting the message of Christ. You know, so people that are hurting, need to be reminded of the power of God's love and to trust in him. You know, one of the things that I've been doing in my spiritual life as a deacon um, is, is uh, praying the surrender novena. You know, and if you're familiar with the surrender novena, you know, after you do the prayer for the particular day, there's a little prayer, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you, take care of everything. And you say that again 10 times, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you take care of everything. 
you know, and I found that surrender to Vito. In fact, I, when I got to day nine, I just started over again with day one. I've been doing that for months now, for months now. And it's been a, a, a true blessing in my life. And so um, one thing that, that deacons can do is, is maybe help with this um, by, by recommending certain things that people can do by sitting down and listening to people's fears and hearing their stories and, and helping them with the consolation of knowing that Jesus is with them the entire time. He's never um, not by our side, right? Uh, even, even when it seems dark, even when it seems where we're alone, we're never alone because Jesus is always with us. You know, we must forgive and we must love and pray for those who hurt us. You know, um, this Jesus says in John um, 14, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give it to you. So, you know, we, we have people out there that are dealing with some very serious stuff going on in their life. And because of what's happened to them, they may have an ex-husband who beat them, you know, when he was drunk. Um, they may have dealing with infidelity. They may be struggling with pornography. They may be struggling not to take another drink or not to use drugs again. They may have been raped when they were in college. They may have been bullied when they were in high school because they had glasses or bla braces or they were the wrong color or they had the wrong accent. Or, or maybe the person was the bullier, you know, and, and um, maybe they attempted to commit suicide because the pain was just too great. And the only way they could see their way out of it was to, to attempt to take their own life. You know, maybe they're estranged from their children. You know, they, they raised their children in the faith. And now these kids went off to college and all these professors with all these letters after their names filled their heads with nonsense. You know, belief in God are for weak minded people. So now they come home and, and now they tell you, I don't know if I believe in God anymore. Or maybe, you know, the person you're dealing with is angry all the time, or maybe they're depressed. Maybe they're in pain constantly. They woke up in pain. They're in pain right now. They're gonna go to bed tonight in pain. They're gonna wake up tomorrow in pain. You know, this is the reality uh, of the pain that people are dealing with in their lives. And, and, and often they don't want to forgive, you know, something that may have happened to them. And so we, we have to love and to pray for the people who hurt us. You know, unlike the love of parents and friends and even spouses that can disappoint us, the love of God, the Father will never, ever forsake us. You know, and, and sometimes people need to be reminded of that. I think in a very beautiful way, in a very gentle way, in a very loving way, but they need to be reminded. Uh, that That's hugely important. And let, let, me, let me drive that point home for you. You know, I haven't been, uh, I haven't been traveling internationally um, since 2019, obviously, because of COVID. Um, hopefully, I'll start getting back out there soon. But my last international trip was to Australia. And I spoke at an event with about 650, 700 uh, middle school students to the Archdiocese of Sydney. Uh, it was a middle school event. And during the talk, I told those young people that one thing I've been seeing when I talk to young people, and all the, I've been to 19 different countries, and all the countries that I've been to is that young people have no idea how much God loves them. They have no clue how much God loves them. And I said that during the talk. After the talk, I got off the stage and there was a young priest that was waiting for me at the bottom of the steps. Now this um, priest was ordained, I think three years. And he said, when he was first, he said, let me drive home the point you just made Deacon. He said, when uh, I was first ordained, I was signed to a high school because they figured I'm young, newly ordained. They may get some vocations out of this, right? So I was teaching religion class. And as an experiment one day, I wrote on the board, on one side of the board, I believe in God. I wrote on the other side of the board, I don't believe in God. And he asked the students uh, to stand under the statement that best represented what they believed. And so he said about 99% of the kids st stood under the statement, I believe in God. And about 1% of the students, probably uh, a few either atheist students or agnostic students who are just at the school to get an education um, and don't really care about the face to understand that I don't believe in God. And everybody sat down and he erased it. Then he wrote, God loves me. And on the other side, God doesn't love me and asked the students to do the same thing, stand under the statement that best represented their position. Father told me that none 
of the students stood under the statement that said, God loves me. A handful stood under the statement that says, God doesn't love me, but the rest just sat there at their desks because they weren't sure. They, they're not, see, it's not enough to believe in God. We must believe God. See, so it's interesting. All those students believe in God, but they don't believe that God loves them. So that tells me there is a serious disconnect that's happening in the lives of so many people. They're disconnected from their faith. And in dealing with people that are seeking, that are hurting, you know, that, that can't forgive, we have to help them to, to show them the power of God's love and witnessing to them, you know, to the power of God's mercy and, and forgiveness in, in their own lives. Um, so how? Here are three tips. Um, first of all, speak from the scriptures compassionately, yet honestly. So when the Bible says, ask, it will be given to you, right? It doesn't mean like <laughs> it's a genie and, you know, God's going to grant you every wish. I want to win the lotto. You know, Lord Jesus, I'm going to win the lotto. And I know I'm going to win because you said, ask and it shall be given to you. <clears throat> right? I mean, uh, God knows the deepest longings and desires of our hearts. And um, he understands that um, uh, that he will grant those things in our lives that will move us closer to him in accordance with his will. Um, and he knows that our hearts are uh, uh, the longest of our hearts and, and who understands who understands our pain. He will not give us what we want, but what we need, right? And he'll never give us anything that's apart from his holy will. Um, and that's the beautiful thing about God's love. And sometimes people just need to be reminded of that. You know, um, so, so using the scriptures as a tool to be able to bring the message of Christ uh, into the life of a person in, in, a, in a more meaningful way. Um, second, God heals those who choose to trust him and who seek to be in relationship with him. You know, so, for example, we see the intercession of Abraham. Uh, remember it with uh, with uh, um, with Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, the intercession of Abraham shows us that when we pray with complete trust in the will of God, the Father will grant those who are in covenant relationship with him the power over his own heart, right? And that's the key, I think, is, is being in covenant relationship with God. You know, it's not, when we talk about, well, God's our friend, Jesus is my brother, but what really, you know, the words of Jesus at the Last Supper are, are critically important. He said, this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, right? He chose his words carefully. Um, the issue is, is that we live in a culture that says that the relationships between people are contracts, are contractual relationships. You know, just like when you go and buy a cell phone, right? You get a contract when you buy the cell phone. Um, and, but but uh, what does that sound like in our culture today? Friends with benefits, hit it and quit it. That garbage language that so many young people use to describe relationships where we treat each other as objects of pleasure and gratification. That's not God's plan for us. When God wants to establish a relationship with us, he establishes not a contract, but a covenant, right? A contract is merely an exchange of goods. This is yours and this is mine. A covenant is an exchange of persons. I am yours and you are mine. To making a complete and total gift of yourself to someone. And that someone makes a complete and total gift of themselves to you in love that is free and faithful and total and fruitful. It's a love that gives everything. It's a love that holds nothing back. Why? Because Jesus held nothing back of his love for us from the cross. He gave everything. And this is exactly what he expects from us. Because let's be real. If you look at the Psalm, Psalm 90, the, uh, the Psalm written by Moses, you know, it, it says our span, our lifespan, right? Our span is 70 years or 80 for those who are strong. And most of these are emptiness and pain. They pass swiftly and we are gone. See, so, so very clear. There is no Easter Sunday without Good Friday, right? There is no resurrection without crucifixion, right? And let's be real. Most of life is crucifixion, right? Um, but sometimes we can get so overwhelmed 
with those things in life that we forget that we're on the path to covenant intimacy with the Lord. And so uh, uh, we have to help people to trust in the Lord and to seek that deeper, intimate, personal, loving, and life-giving communion with him. That, and that's what helps bring the healing in someone's life. And then third, we must entrust our lives to God's will and merciful love. You know, uh, and, and I draw here from the, the uh, words of uh, Pope Benedict XVI, the Space Salvi. You know, when no one listens to me anymore, God still listens to me. You know, God says, you know, remember he says, though father and mother forsake you, I will never leave you. Right. But often we feel so alone. We feel so broken. We're, we're such so much in our pain that we forget that God is there. We're so focused on the pain that we can't see God. We can't feel God or experience God in the midst of that pain. And, and Pope Benedict is reminding us that God is still there. When I can no longer talk to anyone or call upon anyone, I can always talk to God. When there is no longer anyone to help me deal with a need or expectation that goes beyond the human capacity for hope, he can help me, right? So again, in the midst of this coronavirus, there's so much fear, there's there's some the hopelessness because it keeps there's one variant and another variant. It keeps, it keeps going on and on. You know, two weeks to flatten the curve is now coming up on two years. You know, and and this thing needs and we, this thing needs to come to an end. Um, but but again, I, in fact, I know a, a couple, a, a little a, a older a elderly couple that did not leave their house for an entire year. Literally, did not walk out of the only time they walked out of their house was to pick up something on the porch or food delivery or something from Amazon or something like that. So the only time they ever left their house was to pick up something off the porch because of that fear. Again, I get it. You know, the coronavirus is just, we need to take it seriously and wear our mask and distance and all that stuff. But we also have to live our life. We cannot constantly live in a state of fear. You know, when I've been plunged into complete solitude, I pray and I am never totally alone. So just that gift of being able to pray with someone, you know, um, to, to, to not be afraid to touch someone. We got so far, we have people at elbow bumping and don't wanna shake hands anymore. I mean, we, we've lost this interpersonal connectedness. You know, we're, we're seeing each other through streaming, we're seeing each other through Zoom, you know, but we're an incarnational church, right? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. You know, God no longer wanted to be far away from us. He no longer wanted to speak through great men and women of the Bible or through prophets. So he, he wanted to, to touch us with his own hands, right? He wanted to love us with his own heart. He wanted a personal relationship. He wanted to experience us. And that's something we cannot forget in the midst of all this coronavirus stuff, that we, that we are uh, an incarnational church. We need to be with each other. You know, um, and so the more we can, you know, coming on on the other side of the coronavirus uh, pandemic now, the more we can do that, I think the more healing we can bring in, in the lives of, of people. You know, helping preachers understand the reality of God's strength and vulnerability. What I mean strength and vulnerability. When you look at Jesus uh, on, on, on the cross, you know, some people say, look, he's weak. Look, he's defeated. No, that's where his strength comes from. Right, uh, uh, Saint Paul talks about this in in um, in Second Corinthians. He was he was burdened with something. We don't know what it was, um, but he says, you know, he recognized that God was saying to him, "My power is made perfect in weakness." So therefore, I'm content with weaknesses, with hardships, with calamities. It's when I'm weak, it's then that I'm strong, right? Because Paul's realizing that in this human weak human weakness, it is the strength of Christ. It is Christ's strength that lifts him up. That, that emboldens him, that empowers him. It's not just his strength, it's the strength of Christ. And so it's in that beautiful vulnerability and that human vulnerability that we have to rely on the strength of almighty God, right? And that's leading the lost sheep to the shepherd. We can also share stories of saints who have never lost hope in God despite incredible challenges and difficulties. You know, think of Saints Augustine, right? The uh, the, the, the playboy, if you will, you know, that became one of the greatest uh, 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 teachers and, and, and doctors in the church. St. Maria Goretti, who was forgiving the man who was about to rape and, and kill her, 
You know, Josephine Bakita, who was tortured, brutally tortured. And, and again, thank the torturers, because if it weren't for them, she never would have found her faith in Jesus. I mean, these are just... And it's just, again, just a, 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 a few of the incredible stories of hope. And we, again, people may have forgotten or may not be aware of these powerful sources of hope. And these are ways we can help bring healing to our um, parishioners. Now, as preachers, you know, um, we deacons often use personal stories uh, to connect deeply with parishioners because um, uh, they we often identify more closely with the message of a common experience uh, that we share. You know, um, so not being afraid to be vulnerable ourselves, you know, um, to share our vulnerabilities, you know, um, uh, I think is a sign of strength for people. I mean, that's why, for example, The Journey Home is one of the most popular shows in EWTN. People are sharing their stories. They're sharing their experiences of how Christ came into their life. And it's a journey, you know, and sometimes, you know, and I share my story like with my dad. You know, and I didn't speak to him for 18 years. And I share that story of, of what happened and the healing that God eventually brought to our relationship. Um, you know, just so many ways that we can help uh, people to bring hope to people in their lives. You know, sharing our faith journey, for example, I think is a big piece of the puzzle that's often missing in parish evangelization. You know, because, well, it's up to the professionals, right? The catechists, the REs, you know, the priests, the deacons, those are the professionals, you know, but but everyone should be encouraged to, to share their stories. Uh, just recently, I was giving a talk on adoration. I love adoration, by the way. I'm like an adoration junkie. You know, sometimes I just feel sick of needle in my arm, and, you know, an IV bag and intravenous feeding just leave me in adoration. I love it. And so I was, I was talking about how God spoke to my life in, in a very powerful way several times when I went to him in humility, right, and with complete vulnerability and openness to his will, before him in adoration, how God really brought um, a powerful message of uh, into my life. And I asked how many people have had an experience like that? And a bunch of people raised their hand. I was so happy to see that. I was like, yes, you know? And I said, how many of you actually shared that experience with others? Then more than half the, the hands went down. See, so they're keeping those experiences to themselves. But it's exactly in, in this beautiful gift of vulnerability, which again, which needs to be discerned, you know, but I think this beautiful gift of vulnerability is we can we can help really bring that light, uh, uh, be that light for people who are in the darkness. You know, our stories, I think, often provide that aha moment, you know, in people's lives where, you know, that that switch gets flipped and they start to get it. They really start to understand how God begins to work in their life because they say, wow, if, if it did, if it did it for this person, like often when I tell my dad's story, holy cow, if a guy like Deacon Harold's father, a man that was hard hearted, that cursed God, that did all these things, if he can come to faith in Jesus, I know there's hope for me. I know there's hope for my relationship. I know there's hope for my dad or my brother or my mother, you know, whatever the case may be. It really does bring hope. You know, our stories can provide and inspire parishioners um, to conversation, to conversion, and to action, bringing them ever closer to the sacred heart of Jesus, right? And that's that's the key. We want to bring people closer and closer to Jesus. Let's see. All right. So um, that, that's the first piece, right? To bring healing. Now, now we're going to get to the second piece that I think deacons can really uh, uh, help in the parish, and that's through the cultural diversity. Look, we are in a situation right now where race is a massive issue. Uh, tensions, racial tensions are, are again, uh, heightened in our, in our country today. And I think, I honestly believe with all of my heart, in fact, I'm writing a book on this right now. Uh, I really believe with all my heart that the Catholic church can be the leader and the catalyst for real change in helping to, to close the racial divide. Right. So why? Look at our parishes. You know, many parishes, uh, you know, some often look like the church, but there have been incidents where parishes, you know, where there's still issues going. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I was uh, uh, driving to a parish. I was trying to say not I'm not I don't want to say the name of the parish, but uh, it, was, it was about two hours away from the airport. So they had me rent a car and drive to the parish. 
fine, no problem. Um, and so when they when I got to the church, I realized that the rectory was not on the parish campus, not on the parish grounds. It was like at the, I think in a house in the neighborhood, but they gave me the address of the of the parish. Uh, so I needed to find I needed to find the rectory. So I I pulled to the front of the church. I saw someone coming out. I said, "Okay, I'll ask them." So I went, and before I could say anything, I was going to ask them, "Can you please direct me to the rectory?" They just looked at me and said, "Oh, the St. Vincent de Paul conference is closed today." But you see that poster on the door? That's me. I'm actually here because I'm doing the mission. I was just trying to ask you where the rectory is because I could at least meet Father before I have to preach tonight at the Saturday Vigil Mass. Oh, oh, Deacon, sorry, sorry, sorry. But, you know, like, why? You know, why, why? That stuff is still happening in our parishes today. So when we talk about cultural diversity, right, that, that is the possession by our brothers and sisters of a rich, diverse cultural heritage, African, Asian, Hispanic, Caribbean, Native American, um, you know, Croatian, whatever it is, it can be a source of, con of contention and volatility in parishes, right? Or sometimes we can build silos, right, a in our own parishes. Like, oh, that's the Vietnamese mass. That's the Hispanic mass. That's the Cuban, that's their community. And we build silos and we never interact with people because that's not our, that's not our heritage. You know, no, you know what? What does Paul say? There's no Jew, no Greek, no slave, no free, no male, no female, all are one in Christ Jesus. We need to do a better job of appreciating the great gifts that everyone brings to the life of the church. You know, um, you know, and so I think because of that, sometimes tensions can make their way into parish life. I think causing subtle and overt um, divisions within the body of Christ. Um, and so we we are uncomfortable being being around people that don't look like us. Um, and if that continues, it will cause division. And uh, even the perception that one cultural group seems to be favored over another one uh, in a parish. And I think and when we and when those kinds of things happen, I think we miss opportunities to learn and to grow from each other in God's love. And we stop seeing the image and person, image and likeness of the person uh, uh, of God in the person standing in front of us, right? We we don't see the image and likeness of God standing in the person in front of us, and that's tragic. So, um, so what can we do? So, I think that deacons can help create opportunities uh, to appreciate the gift of cultural diversity. So, here are some things because look, the priest can't do everything in the parish. The, the REs, you guys are focused on religious education. You know, uh, the catechists are, are, are working with confirmation or, or, or adult faith formation, you know, like mystagogy, right? So after RCIA, you know, all the Bible studies, all different things going on, doing fantastic jobs in the parishes. But I think the deacons maybe could be the leaders in, in this to facilitate opportunities to create um, greater uh, uh, opportunities for cultural awareness and diversity. Like for example, very simple things. I, I'll give you an example. In our parish, our parish is a small inner city parish in Portland, um, about 210 families, really small. Uh, inner city in the hood, you know, um, right, in, fact, in fact, quite honestly, right now we're dealing with some gentrification that's been happening and moving, you know, certain people out of their neighborhoods. We, we have a lot of um, issues at our parish right now with drug dealing and prostitution that we've never, I've been in the parish 20 years, we've never had these kinds of issues before now. So we're dealing with that now. Um, but we were very diverse, like half the parish is Vietnamese. Uh, we have Africans, we have Filipinos, we have Europeans, we got all kinds of, of people. It's like a melting pot. But when I first got there, I noticed that, I was like, wow, look at this diversity. But then I noticed we were in silos. The Vietnamese had their own thing, the Africans had their own thing, the, um, the Filipinos had their own thing. I'm like, why aren't we mixing better here? Why? And so, so one of the things that we did, we, we started hosting a series of potlucks. So all the people from the di different ethnic backgrounds brought food. And so, you know, the Fili Filipinos brought the pancit and the adobo. Uh, the Vietnamese brought the pho, right? The, the, the uh, fufu, the Africans brought. They all, I mean, from one end of the parish hall to the other, there were tables lined with incredible food. And so uh, people would get the food and we'd sit down and we make sure that people were mixed so you weren't in your clique, you know, so the Vietnamese weren't all together, the Africans weren't all together, we mixed the people around. And then we had people 
uh, that were open to it share their experience, what it was like coming to this country and trying to live their Catholic faith. What is it like living their Catholic faith in this parish? You know, and you hear stories and now people that you never would have given a second thought to, you, they're starting to share, you know, wait a minute, I'm having that same struggle with my kids too, you know? Uh, you know, all of a sudden now you make a deeper connection with people and that started to bring people together. Look, look how many times in the gospels, Jesus is eating, right? He was at the Pharisee's house. He's at the tax collector's house having a meal. Jesus eating all the time, right? Because food is a way to bring people together. And that's why I think he instituted the, the holy sacrifice of the mass in the context of a meal, right? In the context of the Passover, again, a way of bringing food as a way of bringing people together, you know? Um, so parishioners were sharing stories and testimonies of, of their experience. And it was just, it just really, and now we, well, before COVID, we find all kinds of excuses now for potlucks and, the, and to bring people together. One of the things also is don't be afraid of a little cr uh, cultural cross-pollination. What do I mean by that? For example, um, we had a Vietnamese mass, African mass, you know, regular English mass, that kind of thing. So we, we took the choirs and we started crossing the choir. So the, the Vietnamese choir was singing the African mass. The African choir was singing the Vietnamese mass. And, and, we, and now at first we we're like, uh oh, we're not sure how this is going to go. Um, because, you know, the Vietnamese are very structured and very holy and very prayerful. Then the Africans are da 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 da. I mean, it was, it was, we, we thought, uh oh, but it actually worked out to be, to be pretty cool. And, you know, I, I for one love the Vietnamese choir. I don't understand a thing they're saying, but man, the, I, I feel elevated. I feel lifted uh, by that music. And when I was in South Africa, you know, the African, the African choir reminds me of my time uh, touring South Africa, Johannesburg and Durban and Cape Town and, and Soweto and all the many places that I visited during my two week speaking tour. And, and when I, when I deacon at the masses and just to, to see just the absolute spiritual joy you know not not dancing but i mean just a, a real spiritual joy that was reflected in the movement and like for us in in this country dance is entertainment what i saw in the masses and after were dances were was is prayer it's a sacred movement it's a whole different thing than what we're used to so so to bring those gifts into the church i think is is beautiful um you know slowly but surely each group began to appreciate the authentic and reverent cultural expression that acknowledges the, the unique gifts that all of us bring to the life of the church. So, uh, and one of the things we can do also is to teach people to see past stereotypes. You know, who did this so well was St. Teresa of Calcutta, was just absolutely brilliant in this regard. You know, she always saw Christ in the person standing in front of them. You know, so I think, um, you know, uh, one of the ways is again, go back to those words, image and likeness of God, to understand that when we're seeing the person standing in front of us, you know, that we're seeing uh, Jesus, you know, uh, and not a stereotype. And I, I, I can go into more detail maybe during the Q&A of exactly uh, how we can do that. Uh, we make a serious commitment to promote con conversation and dialogue. For example, there are a number of amazing documents that were put out by the church over the years on the issues of race. So brothers and sisters to us, what we have seen and heard. Um, you know, um, uh, the, the, the most recent one that came out um, from the, the USCCB as well, I think back in, 2000, in November, 2019, another beautiful document that came out um, that talked about um, what we can do uh, to, um, to bring the great gift of uh, cultural awareness. So, so, so to sit down, and go through those documents, right? So maybe the deacon could be the facilitator of a group of people that can sit down and, and work through these documents. Uh, and if your church doesn't have much diversity, invite the neighboring church, you know, the, the, the Native American church or the African church, whatever, and, and Hispanic church, and bring those people in and sit down as a group and work your way through these incredibly beautiful documents. Uh, and that the deacon can facilitate that process. You know, I, and, and I think all of these little things will make a big difference in, in bringing down the racial divide. Um, so outside of uh, the parish, we can help um, by cultivating meaningful conversations through using social media, websites, you know, you use technology. I mean, if Paul was here, Paul would be using the technology to spread the message of the gospel. 
So we can't be afraid to use those uh, those modern means of communication because that's where especially young people are, right? To bring those messages to them in the places where they are. Like back in the day, it was theology on tap, right? Now it has to be theology on YouTube or or Instagram or uh, uh, you know uh, what's that one of the TikTok or whatever the kids are on now, right? We need we need to be in those spaces so they can hear the message of of, of truth. And so to conclude here, you know, what are some of the, the good fruit of the act of the diaconal ministry in a parish? The fruit includes love for the church, both for her teachings and her people, um, joy in sharing the gospel, the life-changing news of the encounter with Jesus Christ, peace, right? So these are the same the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Peace before the Lord, stemming from a rich prayer life, especially in liturgy of the hours, Eucharistic adoration, patience and interactions with our bishops, priests, and lay ministers. Um, kindness to our wives, children, and others who support us as we strive to make God known, loved, and served. Goodness toward those in prisons, hospitals, mental institutions, residential facilities, and assisted living communities, right, that often don't feel God's loving touch. They feel isolated, especially people who are part of the parish uh, in a really meaningful way, you know, that kind of feel away uh, from the life of the church now. Faithfulness to our ordination promises. Jump this to those who have a participated in abortion or attempted suicide or abused or struggling. Self control as we cooperate with the grace of the sacraments uh, to defeat the darkness of sin in our lives and eliminate everything that separates us from God's merciful love. So it's in the gift of the diaconate, the ministry of sublime giftedness, where we offer ourselves and love to God and neighbor, that we discover the true meaning of teaching sanctifying and leading as servants of Jesus Christ. And uh, so with that, I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you. Deacon, thank you so much. I'll give you a chance to get a, a, a breath in <laughs> or a sip of water. Um, thank you for, for sharing your ministry with us and your passion as a deacon very inspiring and very hopeful too for the future of our church. Um, so I invite anybody on here that would like to submit a question to do so now. I've got a comment already that somebody really likes your sheep dog analogy. Yeah, and I liked it too. But, the, <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, the editors there, uh, I really didn't like that. I think, I think they thought that the, the some of the deacons reading it might be offended. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to be a sheep dog, but really, you know, like when I was in Ireland, I really got a good understanding of sheep, of sheep, the role of sheep dogs there. Cause you just uh -huh. see them on TV and yes, yeah, sometimes they could be caricatured, but they really play an important role. And that, that was what I was trying to, I think what we settled on was like the shepherd's helper. I think okay. is what we decided on the book. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 But that, that is a vivid image for sure. Yeah. So um, you mentioned early on how the church obviously is struggling to get people back um, into the pews, you know, after COVID or in the midst of COVID. Is there anything that your parish has done or you have heard from other deacons, other parishes, um, efforts that they're doing to try to bring bring back the flock? Yeah, that's a great point. So um, what we see, th the problem with us is that we uh, also have uh, an older community at our parish. So we don't have a youth group. We don't have a young adult group, you know? So um, a lot of the, the the people are in that kind of higher risk category for COVID. So that's why we're not, we're not getting a lot of people back. We did stop the streaming. Um, Cause I think people were just used to just watching, watching, watching and not coming. And so we have had some people return um, and we even had some new people have, have come to the church now. Um, but, um, we haven't seen the numbers now in other parishes that I've been to, they've had, for example, they've had a parish festival. There was one parish in Michigan that had like a bouncy house for the kids and games like carnival type games. And then they had talks like they had me and Dr. Ray Garendi and some other folks come in and we talked to the men. There were separate talks for the women. And then there were talks for every, the, the families and pa the whole parish and it was a wonderful way, just a fun way. It was no cost or anything, but to bring people back together in, in the parish, in the community. There was one parish in Georgia, in the Atlanta area, that had a, a, a summer parish mission. 
because usually parish missions aren't during the summer, right? They're during Advent or Lent or something like that. But they have kind of a a, a, a pre-fall mission, right? At right at the end of the summer before school started again to try to bring people back to the parish and back to the community, you know? And and, uh, and I, in fact, I did a uh, uh, a webinar yesterday for um, for uh, some folks in for Australia, uh, for Perusia Media in Australia. And one of the folks was telling me they have these, just like our parish of the potlucks, they do that every Thursday. You know, they have food trucks that come. And so the, the food trucks provide food and, and these different parishes go on go in on it together as, as a way of bringing people to communion and, and, and to a community again. And they have a prayer service. So they'll, they'll do a rosary and uh, an adoration and they'll have the food and then they'll go back into the church for some more prayers or have a penance service. I'm like, yeah, you know, that's where you roll the sleeves up and really get your, your hands dirty and really, you know, uh, inviting people back to the sacraments. Yes. So I'm hearing from you getting creative, right? Maybe try trying things new, different things to to accommodate people. Yeah, and, and they're not they're not they're not um, gimmicky or glitzy. It's just inviting people to come back. You have to treat it's because our parents are family. So yeah, I think the more we can create a family environment in the parish, I think the more we start welcoming be more of a welcoming community, I think the people will start to come back. Because I mean, I think an unintentional, um, an unintentional side effect of what the bishops did by canceling masses, um, I understand why they did it, you know. Um, but at the same time, uh, even if people's faith weren't that strong, they knew I had to go to church. I have to go to mass. They, that was that. If they know anything else, they knew that. Now they don't have to go to mass. So their whole life they thought that going to mass was important. Now they don't have, now, now again, it wasn't the intention, but in their mind, these people are thinking, well, I guess mass wasn't as important as I thought it was, uh -huh. you know? So now they're, now they don't see, they don't see the point in coming back. So I think, you know, um, you know, the bishops are getting pulled in so many different directions. That's why I think, you know, from the parish level, you know, um, I, I think if the we have uh, what I would really call for is a Eucharistic Renaissance, a, a complete revival and rejuvenation of the life of the church around the Eucharist, Eucharistic processions, having adoration. Even if you don't have an adoration chapel, like having Thursdays from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., having adoration, you know, so people could come in and, and, and adore the Lord and, and be with him, you know, and open their hearts to him. You know, I think. Uh, like I talked about the study groups, there's a new document that came out from the U.S. bishops. I've been talking about this on my radio show. We're going paragraph by paragraph through it right now. You know, it's a wonderful new document. It's basically Eucharistic 101 is what it is. But, but I think it's called The Mystery of the Eucharist and the Life of the Church. It's only 30 pages if you download it. It's 100% it's free. I think it's a wonderful way of uh, raising incredible awareness of the beauty and truth of the Eucharist uh, that I think, again, will help re or revitalize and rejuvenate people's love uh, for the church and for the mass. Absolutely. We've got some questions rolling in here. Um, what advice can you give deacons on how to convince pastors who are cynical about deacons and their role in the parish? Some of us yes. are in parishes where the parish uh, pastors joyfully welcome deacons, but their pastors who have no use for deacons. And I address that head on in the book. Absolutely. Um, and, I, and I'm not, a, and I, don't, I don't shy away from that because there is tension there. Um, see, here's the thing. I think the, these kinds of things happen because priests and also many bishops do not understand diaconal ministry. They, they see deacons as somehow in competition with the laity. You know, um, well, if you have a deacon, we don't need lay people to do this, this, and this. That's nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, Paul, Pope Paul VI, in his document, um, reinstituting the diaconate as a permanent order, um, specifically says in there that one of the roles of the deacon is to uh, support and to em 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 empower lay ministry, not to suppress it and not to take it away. You yeah. know, so so our job is to is to be there to assist. For, so for example. I had a young priest who was, he, he was an associate, he was getting his first pastorate 
He was first time pastor and he was excited, but he's also nervous. He said he had a couple of deacons and he asked me, what should I do with these deacons? You know, I said, okay, look, first of all, sit down with them, discover uh, what their skills are. Right. And talk to them, find out what their skills are, what their background, what their training, what kinds of things are they doing now in the parish? Maybe they're being underutilized. Maybe they're not being utilized properly. You know, maybe there's a, such a strong emphasis on ministry in the church that the, 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 the people outside the church. And I think most of the deacons ministry should be outside of the parish, quite frankly, mm -hmm. because that the people that, that aren't getting the message of Christ, that's where they are. Right. You know, um, so, so I think sitting down and, and, and understanding where these deacons are coming from and even sitting down with their families, you know, and, and looking at the dynamic of the family and making sure that you're utilizing that deacon in the parish in a way that's not causing tension with his family, but not suppressing lay people as well. So, for example, um, I told this young priest, like in my case, my parish didn't have, did not have a deacon before me. And I was nervous that people were going to think, oh, oh he's going to take my job. I didn't take anybody's job. Uh, so for example, the, the, the religious education director in our parish, I did not take over her job. What I did was, you know, um, father wanted to make sure that the materials that we were using, uh, for all the religious education was in, was, uh, faithful to the magisterium, of the teaching authority of church. So he made sure that I would double check to make sure that those, and I, I'm not telling the, uh, DRE what to use. Uh, but I'm just making sure that what they're using uh -huh. is faithful to the church. Uh -huh. You know, uh, another thing, extraordinary ministers of Holy Communion that would bring uh, the uh, the Eucharist to the homebound and things like that. So what Father did was put me in charge to make sure that they were respecting the Eucharist at all times, that they had the picks and that, you know, if there were any um, any particles of the Lord that were left in the picks, that they had to be properly clean. I, you didn't play like, loud music in your car when you're when you have the eucharist with you that you create an atmosphere of prayerful silence and respect for the lord as you're transporting him to this person's house that you're not giving inappropriate blessings you know that you're that you're doing what the rubrics say as a lay person this is what you're supposed to do when you give communion to a lay you're not you're not trying to be like a priest or a deacon you know and so i mean th things like that you know so i didn't take away any anybody's job but he found a way for me to serve to actually to make the service to the people um, even better. Absolutely. I know we're over time, but I want to ask one more question. Sure. Because um, there's some, you know, there are several questions here. Um, how can you or a parish encourage men to apply for the diaconate, if that's the right term? Again, I think one of the things that you have to, to look at is you, have, you see men serving well in their homes and also extending that service ministry into the parish. So for example, for me, what, what father noticed about me was not just that, you know, I was trying to be a good father at home and listen to my wife. Really important guys, by the way, you need to listen to your wife. Yes. Seriously. <laughs> but, um, but I was doing parish council. I was the treasurer for St. Vincent de Paul. I was lecturing. I was serving as a, a, not an institute acolyte, but I was serving mass on the altar, teaching altar servers. You know, I just jumped into the life of the parish, you know, because I felt I felt this call to serve and, and eventually it would, it would uh, be fulfilled in the diaconate. Mm -hmm. But when you when you recognize someone like that, you know, you say, hey, wait a minute, this guy's serving his parish. He's serving all over the place. He's, 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 he seems to be, you know, here at the parish quite often doing a bunch of things. Maybe this guy could use those gifts to serve the entire church and begin to have that conversation. Right, because it's all about discernment. Just because you're in a diaconate program does, by the way, doesn't mean you're going to be a deacon. It means you're discerning, right? Uh -huh. Just like when married couples come to me, they think we're getting married, and I think you're still discerning. <laughs> you know, so yes, yes, uh, I think that's that's part of it as well. Oh yeah, excellent. All right. Well, Deacon, I wanted to talk a little bit here, offer everyone a discount on your book. Can you tell us, um, you know, how a parish, how a deacon, how an individual would benefit from reading our life of service? Oh, yeah. This book is definitely for everyone. I think this I think oh. for deacons, because once I said, well, I'm already ordained. The guy said, I, he said, I'm already ordained. Why do I need this? I said, you know, I've been in my parish for 15 years. I said, you know, we've had the same priest. I said, oh, so if your priest moves 
and you get another priest who doesn't like deacons, how are you going to deal with that? Oh, yeah. yeah so I, I saw the book. I talk about that. For guys in formation, for lay people who want to understand mm -hmm. better the role of deacons, because it's not just me. I, I also have essays at the end of every chapter, short essays from my brother deacons from all around the United States. Different ethnic, uh, different ethnic and racial, cultural backgrounds, um, different years of ordination, you know, different levels of service in the church, you know, all of that. I mean, just so they bring a whole different flavor and perspective, so people can truly understand the nature of diaconal service, both in and outside of the parish. So this is for deacons, people in formation, and um, you know, as a great gift for that man that may be discerning or is already a deacon. Great gift for him as mm -hmm. well. Wonderful. So when using code webinar 1221 for today's date, when ordering at Ave Maria Press got AveMariaPress.com, 25% off. Well, thank you so much, Deacon. Again, this has been really informative and inspiring and so helpful. Um, and I know everyone um, feels the same. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for spending this time with us today. And this is the last of our fall 21 webinar series. So thank you everybody for supporting us um, and for submitting your great questions. And we will begin again January 11th. We'll start our spring series. So look for emails coming to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed Christmas and a merry and a happy new year. Bye-bye. Yeah, God bless everybody. Thanks so much.